Organize Me Radio, episode 39, Moms Talk Autism. I'm Naima Ford-Goldson. Hi, everyone. I'm so excited for the interview you're about to listen to. It's been a long time coming, and I sat down and talked with another mother who has a son with autism, just like me. And the ironic thing is when we started the recording, uh, my son started to have issues, and you will hear some background noise. So fair warning, you will hear noise in the background because my husband was dealing with the issues that my son had. And um, I just felt like the message was too important. The interview was too good to try to re-record it and get the same result. But this is our lives. This is how life is with autism. So take a listen and enjoy. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Organize Me Radio. I'm Naima Ford-Goldson. And today's guest is a family friend, and she is a fellow autism mom. Please welcome Nicole Reese. Hello. Nicole, I'm so excited to talk with you. This has been a long time coming. We've had to reschedule and reschedule and because we're moms and all the things that we do. But um, I want everyone to learn a little bit more about you. You serve in the military. Can you tell everyone about your military background? So I have been in the military for 19 years, which means I have one left. Thank you, Jesus. Um, I am a medical lab scientist, and right now I'm stationed at Fort Gordon in Georgia, and I am one of the, on the leadership team that runs the Kendrick Memorial Blood Center, so we basically collect blood and ship it out to the contingencies overseas, we uh, supply the hospitals on the uh, eastern region, so all the military medicines, Um, yeah, so that's, that's our mission, we go out on the weekends, we go out during the week and we collect blood from the trainees, we uh, to do blood donations in house and we ship it out. So you and I, okay, so on top of like career and being busy, we both have kids that are on the spectrum. Tell us about your son and how that's been going for you. Oh boy, so Rowan <laughs> Xavier is going to be 18 next Wow. Time not believe it you've known him since he was like yay big little yes <laughs> and he is my gentle giant he is six four wow um, like a little celery stalk I call it but he loves art he loves music he is a walking jukebox he knows songs that people our age probably don't even know um you can literally play like the first two seconds of a song and he automatically can tell you who sings it um and he's just the the thing I love about him and the thing that I was concerned about when he was diagnosed is that I was thinking like you know they say some autistic children are motionless or you know I'm a vegetable and he's so affectionate and so Mm -hmm. he's an empath he's so sympathetic to everyone and so concerned about everyone and wanting everyone to be happy all the time so that's my baby that's not a baby anymore Ah, oh, so I can relate because Gavin is eight. He just turned eight and um, he too is so, so, so affectionate. He loves the ladies. <laughs> I was talking to um, his one of his ABA uh, therapists today, one of the RBTs, and um, she mentioned that he started working with a new therapist today. And the therapist was like, he keeps giving me hugs. And she was like, well, you know, Gavin's a ladies man, which he is. He's been like that since he was a baby, you know? Um, so anyway, they just started having him blow them all kisses and everything, you know, so they could actually get work done. But it's, it is funny how, you know, um, well, of course, autism is different for everyone, right? It's, Every single kid on the spectrum is different, which is why it's a spectrum, right? And we know, you and I both know that. Um, But I feel like a lot of people do think that kids on the spectrum are just kind of off in their own world, which that's not the case. That hasn't been the case for me. That's clearly not the case for you. Yeah, I definitely think that they have actually um, a heightened sense of awareness about things that are going on. And that's how it manifests with like all the sensory issues and things that come with that um, being on the spectrum. But I think I definitely think that they're more in tune and situationally aware of the things that we normally would just brush off to the side or not even notice or pay attention to. Because my son definitely can tell and my son, my other, my fur babies in the background now 
but he can def he my son can definitely tell when something is off with anyone and then mm. like are you okay hi his his check-in is high so he's 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 a man of few words but he's gonna check in so yeah so with gavin and i know you've experienced this with with Rowan, he Rowan talks now, but Rowan was nonverbal for a time, and Gavin is nonverbal as well. How did you navigate with uh, Rowan being nonverbal, and when did Rowan start to actually communicate with his words? So Rowan, um, Rowan actually started talking probably um, when he was about ten or eleven, and he still has a significant speech delay. His uh, communication is needs based. But he will, you know, uh, make jokes and he will come up and say, hey, tag, you're in and then take off running, you know, but um, navigating that was, I don't know how I did it, you know, <laughs> uh, it was a give and take because Rowan, um, he couldn't talk, but he could spell. So, you know, he would, um, he would speak letters. So if he wanted something, if environmental print. That was, that was, that's what got us through, right? So he would be spelling the letters of things and I'd be sitting here like, okay, oh God, <laughs> you know, um, but that's how he was able to, um, that's how we were able to work through things. And then the other thing that I've always loved about my kid is he's so expressive, just non-verbally. And we don't, I think we take for granted non-verbal communication, right? So I was able to kind of eventually as we got to know each other, you know, which sounds crazy when you're talking about your kid, but the same way we change and we transition as we're getting older, our kids do too. And um, I was able to kind of figure him out. So I don't know how I did it by the grace of God, I'm telling you, because it was, it, that was a challenge. That was definitely a challenge, but he's, he's come a long way. Um, he still definitely has a significant um, speech delay. He can't really answer why questions, open-ended questions, or why'd you do that? Or, well, how, you know, how are you feeling? You have to give him options and then he can select them. You you mentioning his nonverbal cues. I think that's important because I remember taking like um a I don't know a some kind of speech class. I think it was nonverbal communication or something like that. And I learned that only seven percent of our communication is words, right? So why do people put so much emphasis on words and speaking and feeling like you know these kids have to you know talk to communicate when there are other ways? And it's easy because it's easier. It's easier. And I think that that's one of the things I've learned. Um, I used to be very, um, I'm embarrassed almost to say this, apologetic, almost constantly. Oh, I'm sorry. He has autism. You know, I'm sorry. And I'm sorry. He's making noise in the background, but I'm sorry. My son has autism. Anytime he did anything, I felt like I needed to apologize and justify why he was doing it. It was more of a defense and a protective mechanism. There, but um, I realized like, no, we, they need to accommodate you. We're not going to accommodate them. We're going to, right. You know, I definitely want him to go out into the world and be functional, but at the same time, it's like, we, it doesn't need to be easy. You know, it doesn't have to come easy for people who don't know any better, unfortunately, and navigating their ignorance. It's like, we're going, we're going to, it's a give and take basically. It's, it's, it's funny to me how you say you're, you were a little apologetic because I'm like the opposite. So it's like, if I'm out with Gavin and Gavin's doing his thing, Gavin's being Gavin, I let him be. Yeah. And I'm always like, say something. It took me a while though. It took, and it was because of some stuff I think I was dealing with, with not really fully understanding autism, not fully understanding how that worked out. But um, definitely it was, it was a, there was a transition or a shift. And then I was like, yeah, what yeah. Fuck? What is uh -huh. this? You know, and I saw there's a t-shirt that says, you know, he has autism. What's your excuse? And that's how, that's how I, that's how I moved after that. Like he has a reason. What it, what's your reason for being, you know, so yeah. One in 59 kids, one in 47 boys. Again, I'm probably wrong in that statistic, but it's somewhere in there. So a lot of kids are being diagnosed with autism now, which means we have a whole lot more kids that we need to accommodate. And I feel like people who, um, who are in families with other people that have autism are definitely more, um, you know, empathetic to what, you know, what they might go through and show more grace. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, but do, have you ever had any issues like in public where, you know, Rowan is just being Rowan and people are looking at him like everywhere. Like crazy, you know? Yeah. There all the time. Rowan will be out. And the thing about autism, right, is that you can't you can look at a child that has down syndrome. You can tell right. down syndrome. Usually if a child is blind, they'll have some type of assisted something and you can possibly tell that they're blind. When you see kids with autism, I think us moms or I don't want to just, I don't want to, you know, exclude the dads, but the parents or the family members or the, the teachers, we know, right? We know, right. That, we know, um, we know how to recognize, right? Right. Rowan will be walking in the mall and he'll just see girls. He's eight, almost 18. Hi girl. <laughs> <laughs> and then like, oh, ew, you know, like, why is he talking to us? Or, you know, when he were, I, rem I remember this dialogue we had um, actually about Gavin going out um, and Eric, it was something that you and Eric had been talking about. I remember you posted it about like him going out for to restaurants and stuff and like mm -hmm. not necessarily wanting to take him or not necessarily wanting to, because, you know, people will look and now you feel like right. you're competing on other people's good time and whatever. And I'm like, mm -hmm. the only way he's going to learn how to, how to navigate that if, if right. him in that environment. So right. I've gotten to the point where like you now, I'm unapologetic. I don't care. Yeah. And and it's it's terrible to say, but I do sometimes still tell people that he has autism, but it's solely so that they can kind of get that blow when they've been a jerk, you know, or they yeah. can, it's like, oh, you know, my son has autism. He didn't, he doesn't know, he doesn't mean any harm. And then it's like, Oh, I'm sorry. And I'm like, why are you sorry? I'm not sorry that my son has autism. Yeah. Right. I yeah. Apologize to me. You know, if you, if you're sorry, you can apologize to him, but not about him being autistic. Apologize about your behavior. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I feel like, I also feel like, you know, being a parent of a, of a kid on the spectrum, it just, you kind of think about autism differently because I feel like, um, you know, I don't know. I just, I think I felt differently about it in the past. And I've worked with kids with autism, but then it's like, now one of my kids has it. And I'm like, are you sure this is autism? Because <laughs> this is autism, you know? So I feel like, you know, it's, of course it shows up in so many different forms and everything. And, um, but I definitely feel like as a parent, you feel a little bit differently about it. So you co-authored a book recently. Congratulations on that. On that. Can you tell us about our uh, about your book because you mentioned Rowan in it? Yes, definitely. So um, the book I have here is called "In My Father's House." Um, actually, one of my mentors reached out to me, and she is a woman of the the Janet will call of all trades. She has a ministry. She has an LLC, um, a life coaching. Um, and development program. She does a lot of stuff. And she reached out to me because she had, I've always wanted to get published. I've always wanted to write a book. And this was a way for me to get my feet wet. So basically what this book um, is, is a, a project, a compilation of four authors. And in it, we're just talking about, we're all in ministry and we're all talking about the various struggles that we've had throughout life. But more importantly, you know, how God's promises have manifested through those challenges. So of course, one of my biggest challenges turned triumphs has been, you know, finding out my son had autism and it being devastating and me, you know, in the early yeah. time, not knowing anything about it and just how I've navigated through that. And not just me, but Rowan too, um, how we've navigated that, especially in the church. So how that's come to pass and how he's definitely triumphed over that. So yeah, congratulations again on that. Um, it's so cool to be able to uh, say that you wrote about your son in a book, right? And making more people aware of autism. But like you said, your early 2000s, like that was tough. You see, for me, there's a lot of like resources out there now, you know? So it's a little bit easier for me to, to navigate. Of course, it's devastating too when you first get that diagnosis. It's like, oh my God. What does this mean? What does this mean for my kid? What does this mean for me? Like, how how are we gonna get through this? What does this mean for the rest of his life? What does this mean for the rest of my life and everything? Because you can't you can't point to one other child. Well, this person's child was like this, or this person's kid was like this, because all the all the kids are different. So you really, it's like really a wild card with what you're what you're um for lack of a better term, what you're getting or what what's how things are gonna turn out. So. Mm -hmm. 
Now, I can't help but notice your earrings. I love them so much. They're like puzzle pieces. Where in the world did you get those from? Excuse me. Listen, I got these earrings. It had to be like 14 years ago. Oh, okay. So they don't make them anymore, probably. I'm trying to find out the information. I just remember I got them through Etsy. Um, and I'm sure someone makes some, but I, I will not get rid of these. I love jewelry. And these are yeah. the, like, ones that I'll never, I pull them out every now and then, especially in April. And I, I can't get rid of them. But. I love it. Okay. So again, you're talking about Rowan is about to turn 18 years old and everything. How have you been able to manage your time with a special needs child? So it's been a transition and I feel like I'm reaping the, I'm reaping the benefit of having a, a teenager in some respects. Now, when Rome was Gavin's age, there was no leaving him unsupervised. If I left him unsupervised, I was going to pay for it. So yeah. a lot of my free time, a lot of that white space on my calendar was consumed with me trying to keep him occupied in positive and productive ways so that he wasn't getting into things and tearing up things out of curiosity and, um, you know, uh, or just not having that structure and it throwing him off completely. But now he's a teenager girl. So I'm telling you, he does not want to be bothered with me. So I come home from work. He is holed up in his room, like very much like a teenager, as long as he has food and Wi-Fi. <laughs> and his <eyes> are, <laughs> he is good. He loves art. Um, he loves art. He loves art. So He's in there with, as long as he has crayons and paper, he's in there. If I come in his room and talk to him, he, you could tell he's trying to rush me through the conversation, like, get out of here. So I'll even ask him, like, you want me to leave you alone? He's like, yes, leave me alone. I'm like, okay, teenager, you know. So um, it's different now. It's like in the last year or so, it's been very different. I actually get in my feelings because I'm like, yeah. He's not, you know, he doesn't want to be bothered now. And now I want to be bothered when I needed some time, you know, that's when he was all up under me. So it's, it's very different now. But um, what I will say is for kids like Gavin's age, you have to be very intentional about carving out time, especially with, with um, kids that have siblings, right? And then carving out time for yourself as well. Like mm -hmm. that's, that, that was, yeah, definitely something that I had to be exceptionally intentional about yeah now let me tell you i'm i'm still trying to figure it out it's it's so hard um i don't think a lot of i know there are parents who don't have special needs kids and they're like we're all busy <sighs> i don't think they understand like having a special needs child puts you know you're busy you think you're busy as a parent throw special needs onto that because you're gonna be you'll have no time for yourself at all and then I think when you have, you know, kids that don't have special needs, then you have stuff to look forward to like, oh, well, when they're this age, this, when they're this age, then this with me. And like we said, we were explaining earlier, autism is such a spectrum. So you don't know what you're going to get. So I have, I don't know if Gavin's going to be chill, like Rowan, when he's a teenager, you know what I'm saying? When I wake up in the morning. I don't know what I'm getting because there could be something that could have triggered him um, or, you know, he's overstimulated or he's very hypersensitive, sensitive, sensory rise, right? Yeah. So I couldn't figure out why on Saturdays he was always grouchy. Like every other Saturday, he would just be in a mood and it, his behavior would be wonky. And it was because the um, my neighbor mows the lawn. Ah. It's from the lawnmower. Now he can sit here and listen to John Legend and his earbuds, you know, and be blasting it and be fine. But that noise out, that external noise was just driving him crazy. And it's kind of like if, like just you know what happened with me with the dog it's like I can't even focus right now because this dog is making noise I can't yeah. talk to you right imagine for a kid that has hyper you know sensory issues then that's right side. and so I had to kind of understand like huh, okay that makes sense I get it because I'm like it's a lawnmower what, what's the problem so yeah it just you never know you never know. yeah yeah and Gavin is big on the sensory, the sensory issues too, like huge sensory issues, any loud sound, um, any light that's too bright, you know, anything like that. He's like covering his ears, he's covering his face and, you know, all that. So you just, you never know what you're going to get. But like you said, you have to figure out how to carve out the time 
for yourself. And what I did do to um, help me with, you know, getting more time to, you know, do my podcast, to do my business, to, you know, meet with friends. I got, I recently got an au pair and so far it's been so helpful because, you know, I have a big family, so I have a big support system, but they're not in Atlanta. (laughs) So, so I think having that support system is really important too. How has your support system helped with Rowan? Listen, I, and I put it in the book. My mother is a saint. Okay. So shout out to my mother, Roslyn. She is a saint. She has held, especially being in the military and being a single mom, she has absolutely held me down. She, in fact, Rowan is with my mother right now for the summer. She's taking him to swim lessons. She's retired. She was in the military. So we're both serving in the military and we're both juggling this baby basically um, Hmm. throughout my career. So I've been fortunate spring breaks and things where I, you know, the mission dictated that I needed to be somewhere. She's always stepped up and been there. So I've been fortunate in that respect. Now, what about protecting your energy and managing self-care? Like raising raising Rowan, was it easy to find moments for yourself? <laughs> what did you do? That word easy, it's like, huh? Yeah, nothing easy about it, right? <laughs> no, um, it was rough. Um, there are literally, I remember a day when Rowan was about four, where he was just, I can't, I don't have any other way. He was wilding. And I had left church. I was in a dance ministry and we were driving back. And I mean, he literally had somehow wiggled out of his booster seat and like threw it at me while I'm driving down the boat. Oh, no. And then like climbed up while I'm driving. You know, and I, Oh my goodness. I literally like had a nervous breakdown, I swear. And I called my mother like hysterical, like I can't do this anymore. I don't know I'm going to do this. And I'm just not, I don't feel like I'm a good mom. You know, my mother got on the road and drove from South Carolina to Maryland just to help me out and give me some respite. But um, there have been really good days really great, awesome, amazing days. And I think those have outweighed the difficult ones, but, um, yeah, I, I don't, I'm telling you, I, I, I stand on this. It is the grace of God that has got me through those difficult days. Um, and then the hope that, you know, this is a day in his life. And I, what's encouraging to me is I know people who have, I've been fortunate enough to meet people who have kids older than Rowan. And I see how the therapy, I see how the consistency, I see how one of the things I always say is I will not let autism be a crutch for him. So, Mm. you know, I get, I'll make concessions. We will um, make accommodations, but you're never going to use that as an excuse why you can't do something. You're always going to at least try to attempt it. So um, yeah, seeing those older kids that are, even the kids in his class, there are a couple mm-hmm. of people in them uh, with beards and mustaches. Oh my God. Like, and and just seeing them navigating through life and, um, and gaining senses of independence, that's what's been, um, that's what's been encouraging for me. That's what gives me hope, yeah. So let's talk about um, Rowan and what it's like for him to, is he tidy? Gavin is very tidy. Is Rowan tidy? Rowan is very Rowan-ish. <laughs> I love that. So one of the things that's been very important to me, just as a mom of a boy, is everything in my house has to have a place. It belongs in a room. It, it goes in that specific room, and that's where it belongs. And so towards the end of the day, I try and make sure that we put, at a minimum, we put the things back in the rooms where they belong, right? Right. In Rowan's room, which is his own territory, I have a wicked case of OCD, but I've kind of bowed gracefully out and let him kind of run it. And surprisingly, he does keep it neat. He just does things that kind of drive me nuts. Like he likes Ziploc bags. He loves to draw pictures. And then he'll uh, take little bits of paper and draw on them and draw little people. And then he puts them in a Ziploc bag. So he has this Ziploc Mm. bag that a regular person would think is full of trash, but it's really his little people, you know? (laughs) Oh, And everything in his room, he's very particular. He has a, a rack where he hangs his mask and um, he everything has its place. And if you move it, he will notice. Um, he is very, very observant. So that, um, he's very tidy now. Now he's very tidy, except in the kitchen. 
that is we're working on that does he actually cook in the kitchen he um can make himself sandwiches not cooking with heat or anything i don't trust him yet he can microwave i'll let him do that <laughs> what rowan right now is that rowan doesn't understand the concept of if you use a glass and i think i did this i remember specifically my mother fussing at me about this as a teenager he'll get a glass he'll pour himself a drink he's pretty independent in that respect and then you know uh, two hours later he's thirsty again so what does he do in the cabinet another glass mm. so while i'm at work i come home and there's like eight glasses from every i can tell everything <laughs> the day. then you know there's the bowl of cereal that still has the milk in it and so we're trying to work with like um rinsing dishes at least he's he's tried to help me load the dishwasher so we're getting there we're getting there but he will not use the same. If he drank milk in one glass, then he cannot drink the grape juice out of the milk glass. Even if it's, you wash it, it's, you can't. Mm. Yeah, there are neurotypical adults that do stuff like that, so. Yeah, definitely, definitely. <laughs> what do you think has been your biggest challenge when it comes to raising a child um, on the spectrum? Um, my biggest challenge has been myself. My biggest challenge mm. in my um, insistence um, I, like I said earlier, I went from a stage of being very apologetic and feeling like almost like um, it was an income, not an income, my son was an inconvenience, but that his behavior and the way it, the autism manifested itself was inconveniencing everyone around them. And I'm a very considerate person, like just in general, I don't want to inconvenience anyone. I don't want to be too loud. I don't want to be, you know, and so I would feel like I was disrupting people's peace somehow mm -hmm. by allowing him to just be him. And then I just got this like, you know, light bulb moment, like, no, he is fine. Like he will be. Yeah. So it was finding, my challenge has been finding a balance between my son has autism and there are going to be certain things that are challenging to him and certain things he has difficulty doing versus the stubborn mama and me that we can do all things through Christ and you're going to figure this out. And so finding that balance of, okay, push him, but understand, push him, but don't yeah far push him but still keep at the forefront of your mind that you do have a special needs kid who is awesome and he's a rock star but there are going to be things that will be a challenge to him he's just going to have to find unique ways to do those things um so that's been my challenge because i am stubborn no you're going to figure this out you can do this so even something as simple as him he spilled something on his carpet and i'm like you know mama you're gonna clean that up just like i, mm. had when I was little but you got a vacuum in and vacuums are loud. So how are we going to figure this out? Do I need to get you some headphones? So Rowan will sit there like this. <laughs> and oh, wow. We're still going to do it because you made the mess, you know. So mm -hmm. it's being sensitive to those sensory things and those, for lack of a better term, issues that he has. But still, like, you're going to be, you're going to, in real life, this is how we function. So this is what we're going to Yeah. 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 So how are you feeling about him, uh, turning 18 um how what's gonna happen like when he's done with school and everything how is he gonna go out into the world do you ever see him being in college or anything like that so i'm not sure because rowan goes through these um these spurts where you know he's kind of plateaus in his development and things are going really good but not maybe not necessarily anything new. And then he just shoots off like a rocket. That's why I say he's a rock star. And he's doing all this stuff. And I'm like, wait a minute, have you been playing me? Cause you're doing yeah. all this stuff where his teacher will tell me he's doing things. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I didn't know he could do that. You know, he, yeah. you know, he gets home and he, all of a sudden he can't do these things. Um, I, so first of all, Rowan, um, and this is uh, admittedly, I can tell you this. This was kind of a challenge as far as like transparent moment. Rowan, if he was neurotypical, would have been finishing high school this year. So seeing my friends where we were pregnant together and I'm yeah. the same age and they're graduating and I'm like, you know, but I'm still thankful because I also have friends who had boys who are no longer here. So um, he still has four years of high school left in Georgia. They do senior one, two, three, and four for special needs um, for the kids on the spectrum. And then what I would, what I, my hope for him is that I want him to, um, they've been testing him to see like what kind of jobs he would do um, and that he get a, a vocation and perhaps maybe possibly if I'm ready, if I'm ready, right, he can live like in an assisted living 
place with maybe other autistic children um, or adults, young adults. Uh, that's right down the street from my house. <laughs> but <laughs> you know, I don't want to be a helicopter mom. I literally got. I'm a. You know, and uh, your sister probably told you. Um, I'm a crybaby, right? And his teacher was like, "Yeah, so we're talking about you know the vocation and life after school and whatever." I started crying because the idea of him not being at home with me is like, what? No, he's gonna be with me forever. But I also don't want to. I don't want to limit him. So. I'm open to it, I guess. So if you had one piece of advice to give to parents of a a kid on the spectrum, what would that be? That your child is your child. Um, Like I said before, I look to other, especially the older kids for hope as far as um, capabilities and um, just the idea that where you start is not where you're going to finish, but your child is your child. And you got to... Embrace their personalities, um, embrace their idiosyncrasies, embrace the things that they love and, you know, be aware of the things they don't like um, and just push them, but not too far. You know, you don't want to push them to be like anyone, push them to be their best version of themselves. I love it. So since this is Organize Me Radio, I have to ask, do you have any organizing products that have helped you with Rowan? Is there anything that he loves to use? So Rowan's been dabbling in laundry. And so we have this really neat um, three divider laundry. Um, laundry, I, it's a mechanism. I don't know. I want to call it a basket. But a three little basket. A sorter. So it's like a laundry sorter. And so he's able to put all his giant clothes, because I told you six four in them. And then, you know, I have my section and then we have like towels and stuff to go in the other. So rather than do like the darks, lights and um, whites, we just separate our clothes and then we do the, you know, the communal stuff. And he likes to wheel it from the part of the house we have it in and put it in the laundry room. And then he wants to put all the clothes in the wash machine at once. So I'm trying to teach him how to sort, but that, that thing is a lifesaver. Just being able to wheel that thing across the house. And then my other thing is I have storage baskets everywhere with little, whatever's doohickeys, things for dog toys, uh, baskets with dog toys, um, baskets with hand sanitizer. There's one right there. (laughs) I see it. (laughs) Being able to put things in baskets and it look neat and be put away, but I still have access to it. So those are the, those have been the lifesavers for me because it declutters. I love it so much. Nicole, thank you so much for being on. I think that this will help a lot of parents, you know, a, a lot, um, a lot of parents, I feel like are suffering in silence and, you know, just trying to make it through the day, just trying to you know, get from point A to point B and everything. And I think that this conversation will be helpful to my listeners who, you know, have kids that might be on the spectrum or have some other type of special needs. And um, I feel like it also gives hope because here Rowan is about to turn 18 years old, you know? It's like a stab in my heart every time you say, no, I'm joking. He will be 18 next, at the end of next month. And I am not ready. I'm not ready, so kudos to you for like getting there, you know, like you made it, you made it. And of course it's still, you know, this is something that they have for their entire lives and everything, but whew, you made it through childhood. <laughs> well, I'm <laughs> now, so. <laughs> and Gavin, oh my gosh. Yeah. yeah. So in 10 years, we'll be where you are. <laughs> yes. Yes. So Nicole, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate you being here today. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for joining us for this episode of Organize Me Radio. Be sure to tune in next time for an all new episode.